Welcome to Empire State Engagements. I'm Dr. Robert Childs. I spoke with Dr. Elizabeth Cohen about her Bancroft Prize winning book, Saving America's Cities. We discussed the career of urban planner Ed Logue in places like New Haven and Boston, and especially across New York State under Governor Nelson Rockefeller. We also discussed Logue's final act in the South Bronx and the important lessons of this history for our own time. You know, we do need the dollars that only the federal government can supply because only the federal government can take on debt. Cities and states can't do that. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I, I want people to recognize that we should be very critical of the bad things the government has done, the negatives, but we also shouldn't give up hope. And we should look for the moments when federal money did go to some good causes. Welcome to Empire State Engagements. I am absolutely thrilled to be joined today by Professor Lisbeth Cohen. Dr. Cohen is the Howard Mumford Jones Professor of American Studies and a Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of History at Harvard. From 2011 until 2018, she was the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and her works, which uh, have been monumental, uh, include uh, Making a New Deal, uh, which is a book uh, that uh, in graduate school, I will say changed my life. Uh, and it is of course, uh, the Bancroft Prize winner from 1991 and also a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Uh, she is also the author of A Consumer's Republic, The Politics of Mass Consumption in Postwar America, which I also absolutely love, but which is currently quarantined at College Park. And uh, her writings have appeared in uh, numerous edited volumes, uh, all sorts of both popular and scholarly publications from the New York Times to the Atlantic to, of course, the New York History Journal. And her most recent book, Saving America's Cities, Ed Logue and the Struggle to Renew Urban America in the Suburban Age, was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in October of 2019 and also won the Bancroft Prize that in 2020. And it is an absolute privilege to have the opportunity to speak with Professor Cohen about that work. And so welcome, Liz. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, so you have had, as everyone I'm sure is aware who's watching this, you've had a remarkable career pursuing history from the bottom up. I remember, and I alluded to a moment ago, and I, you may remember, uh, it was probably 12 years ago, I was a graduate student at College Park and you came and spoke uh, about sort of early portions of the Logue uh, project. And I had the opportunity to ask you, how did you capture so eloquently and so compellingly the voices of 
ordinary working class Chicagoans in making a new deal. And you gave me a few pointers that I think um, really the parts of my work that I'm proudest of were very much shaped by the advice that you gave. And so I'm grateful. And that's, it's been such an important contribution of your career. And now, uh, and you point this out in the introduction, you've sort of flipped your perspective a bit. Uh, and now you're approaching it sort of from the top down, from those who are uh, in positions of power. And so I, I guess a, a place to start is, uh, what drew you to that switch in perspective? Well, I think that there were many reasons. I'll start with the fact that um, I like to give myself challenges, as most people do. So I didn't want to write a clone of other books that I'd written. I did want to challenge as a writer. And so that, that's kind of a starting point. But over time, and I, I think you can see this to some extent in Consumers Republic, I became increasingly interested in the built environment and how it came to be. And I had written in Consumers Republic about the explosion of mass suburbanization in the post-war period uh, with you know, a, a certainly an assumption that that had an impact on cities, but not that was not the subject of my investigation. So when I turned to what I was gonna do next, I thought, you know, I really would like to understand what the impact of this mass suburbanization was on cities and, and not just on cities uh, as policy, but also on the physicality of cities, what they look like, how they struggled to survive, um, to attract people, to be the kind of sites of consumption that they had been before the shopping malls that I wrote about in Consumers Republic, you know, sort of emerged. Um, so I was interested in that. And then I was thinking, well, what would be a way of getting at this that would be um, effective and that would also include in it the agents of decision-making and power so that it wasn't just kind of a vague sense of agency. Uh, so I needed to have protagonists. And so when in turning to who was shaping and responding to uh, suburbanization, I, I needed to have people. And the obvious people were people who had power and influence. Um, which meant that I was going to take a very different approach to what I had taken before. So that was a general kind of sense of where I wanted to go. The challenge as a writer was maybe I would do something that was more biographical than I'd ever done before, since I might be focusing on a small number of people rather than on a social group, which is what I had mostly looked at before. And then I went kind of shopping for a good candidate. And I had come upon Ed Logue in a course that I had taught at Harvard on Boston history. And when we got to the 20th century and the emergence of what was called the new Boston, um, I had certainly discovered Ed Logue as someone who was credited for a lot of that turnaround. Boston was in terrible shape from the 1930s on. It, it didn't really recover at all until the 1960s and thereafter. So Ed Logue was in my mind and I started kind of Googling around and discovered that he had left a huge cache of his papers at Yale, his alma mater, um, and really very large at all the jobs he had had. He held on to things and then gave it all gradually to Yale. That was one thing. I could not find any books that were written about him. He showed up in books. He certainly had written things himself, though not anything sort of monumental. I later learned that he had actually intended to write a memoir and had only gotten one chapter down at the point at which he died because he really wasn't a writer. He was more of a doer. Um, so I, I then wrote to people who in urban history and urban sociology, people who had some familiarity with Logue and would know if any books were in the works wrote to Ken Jackson, wrote to a number of other people. Everyone confirmed that there really wasn't anything. A few people had thought about, Lynn Segalen had thought about doing a book about Logue, but had not. Um, so it just seemed like a good candidate. Then I discovered that his wife, his widow, was still alive out on Mar Martha's Vineyard. And I made a connection to her and she proved to be very helpful to me uh, throughout the book. 
Um, and there were papers that were still there that hadn't yet been given to Yale. So I did go there and look at them and I interviewed her. So all the pieces kind of came together and um, it seemed like a good way to take this on. I should say one other thing, which was that I was looking for someone who would be a vehicle for me more than a life story. I mean, I, I cared about the person, but I wasn't trying to explain Ed Logue. I was using Ed Logue to open up some bigger questions about how cities had responded in the post-war period to get us also beyond some of these very superficial arguments about urban renewal, all bad. Um, and that was the end of story for post-war cities. Um, so, you know, I was really looking for somebody who would be a good vehicle. And it, it was certainly attractive that Logue had worked in a number of cities. He, he was in New Haven in the 50s. Then he moved on to Boston in the 1960s, as I mentioned. And in 1968, he went to work for Nelson Rockefeller in New York State and headed a statewide urban renewal agency, the Urban Development Corporation. And then from 1978 to 85, he worked in the South Bronx, heading something called the South Bronx Development Organization. And when he left that job, there were 15 more years before he died, um, not quite 75. And um, he, um, at that point, he taught at MIT. He ran a small uh, development company, uh, which didn't do a whole lot, but kept his, his, him, him in the game. Um, and so he, he presented me with an opportunity from the early 1950s to 2000 to tell a bigger story about what people had done to try to kind of keep cities viable in the post-war period. Well, I uh, I was going to ask actually how you discovered Logue, so you've you've addressed that. But um, it's interesting how this story fits into your other works. I was thinking about that a lot as I was reading it, and um, one way, uh, and this is probably the most biographical section of of the book, is you know we get to know his background, um, and I mean he's not from. Uh, working class uh, Chicago and Southern and Eastern European or African American, but he's Irish Catholic, working class Philadelphia, and a New Dealer, as you say, often a New Dealer to the core and a labor man. And so he sort of comes from a similar perspective uh, to some of the people that you write about, I think. Um, and then later, I think in some ways, this book also is, as you just suggested, sort of how do cities respond to the world that you see being created in your second book, A Consumer's Republic? And so I think it, it nicely, it's, it's, it's almost sort of an elegant, I don't know whether this was intentional, but sort of a nice elegant trilogy in, in a very uh, sort of not, uh, not looking artificial, now I'm going to do this. It just sort of, it, it, certain themes weave through the entire way. I, I don't know if that was intentional, um, but, but maybe that's a starting point for talking about Logue is he comes out of this working class, Irish, Catholic, uh, New Dealer, Philadelphia world. Um, and that seems, to, that, that seems to influence him all along the way, including at Yale, where that makes him sort of different from a lot of his classmates, right? And, and what, what is the meaning of that to his formation, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting for me as an historian doing a, a writing something biographical to decide what should be included and what not. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are, I read a lot of his personal letters. There was a, I know a lot more than, than is in the book about his life. So I, but I ultimately decided that I would really limit myself to the kinds of things that I thought he had experienced as a person that in fact true, proved relevant to the work that he did. Um, and you know, I knew that there would be readers who might be frustrated that I didn't stop and discuss his marriage or his relationship to his children or, you know, and it, there were a few places, actually a good friend of mine who has written a lot of biographies, Susan Ware, um, read the draft and there were a few places where she said, you know, I really think you need to tell us more, you know, how old were his children when they moved to New York, for example, I wanna know that. So, you know, I did relent a little um, 
it didn't hold everything to that test of relevance to the, the sort of public story. But in general, that was my rule of thumb, that I was going to tell you things that I thought were important. And so, for example, um, what I do say at a certain point is that, you know, he I do mention the way in which alcohol had been kind of part of this male world uh, of the, the, um, the urban redevelopment office, that at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the bottle of scotch would come out of the bottom desk drawer and there would be a kind of sociability that the many mostly men would have, or there would be the, the, the business lunch. Um, and I, and it, yet it didn't really have an, much of an impact, I didn't feel, on his work productivity. So I just mentioned it as part of my discussion of male sociability and the, male, the masculinity of this work in the 1950s, particularly, and into the 1960s, women do eventually come into these jobs. You see that over the course of the book, particularly by the South Bronx by the 80s. Um, but it did become relevant to him and his ability to function after the crisis of the UDC's collapse uh, in the mid 1970s. And, and in the, there was a period of about three years between what was a really big personal crisis as well as a institutional crisis for the UDC and his taking on of this job in the South Bronx in 78. And there it felt relevant, you know, to mention that some of his friends and family were deeply worried about him. So I dealt with it there. Um, but that's just an example of, you know, where I didn't want to just be gossipy. I wanted to reveal things when I felt it mattered. Um, and I had found in his papers a very moving letter that his brother had written him about his concerns about his drinking. And so I do cite that letter in that discussion um, at that crisis moment. But I use that as an example to you of where I was very careful about what and when I would discuss certain issues. No, that, that I, th I think it's very effective. Um, I, I think that a part of his uh, background that, and, and his sort of personal life that, that did seem to matter a great deal was, again, his sort of upbringing in Philadelphia, his working class background, his affection for Franklin Roosevelt and the way that that shaped his views as a young man um, coming out of school uh, and even uh, in his early parts of his career. Um, was there a way, uh, when you're studying his Yale years, um, I love how you talk about his sort of pro-labor stance making him stick out and um, is there a way that Yale shaped him in a way that was different from the way it shaped other people who came out in that mm -hmm. period because of his biography. So sort of how his background interfaced with the Ivy League world. Because I thought that was an yeah, interesting- Yeah, it's a very point. good question. I mean, I, I think I tried to paint it as a kind of love-hate relationship. He remained very loyal to Yale throughout his life. It was really crucial for his career. Um, it got him out of, as you described, this very Philadelphia-based world. I would say the family was more lower middle class. His father was an assessor for, this, for the city of Philadelphia, but then died very prematurely having a very simple operation. It was just a terrible fluke. And his mother, who was, um, had been a kindergarten teacher and had very little income, struggled with uh, you know, her, uh, her multiple kids and uh, not much income. And her, she had a brother who was, I think, a contractor and he kind of set them up in a house in a in kind of on the outskirts of Philadelphia. So they had that, they rented out the top floor for a while to make ends meet. So anyway, he came, he was on full scholarship to Yale and um, he worked in the dining hall as a result. So he went there knowing he wasn't what one of his friends called one of the white shoe boys, um, you know, the privilege. And, you know, I have some interesting statistics, as you know, in the book about how privileged, and it wasn't just Yale, it was Princeton, it was Harvard, the Ivies were like that. Um, 
his his co-workers were, his co-students were, but there were exceptions and he was very drawn to those students and many of them felt that they lived in a world apart. Uh, and one of the poignant examples I give is when Roosevelt is reelected in 1940, they feel like, you know, everybody else is in mourning because, you know, Wendell Wilkie wasn't elected and they're feeling jubilant. Uh, and they, they just are reminded that they are living a world apart. But what happened was that Yale, although it was more liberal in its admissions policy in the 30s than it had been uh, for many years and decades before that, uh, they continued to uh, assign students to roommates based on their uh, their status as, you know, scholarship or not, and their religion and ethnicity. So it turned out that Catholics and Jews were kind of put together. Uh, and there was a very clear policy that we're not going to mix that. And so when I interviewed his brother, Frank, who was still alive at that point, he no longer is, but, um, and he actually was already in some dementia, but he did remember enough. He said he, he, he hadn't really thought this through. And he said, you know, it's funny that most of my friends were Jewish. Uh, most of my room roommates were Jewish. You know, funny thing about that. But I knew that that was not an accident. And so I do think that it both gave him a sense of authority and power in society that he could do things, that he was part of this, you know, kind of somewhat privileged world, but he didn't forget his origins. And uh, one, he, he got to know a lot of workers at Yale when he worked in the dining hall. And then when during his college years, many of the workers uh, at Yale who were you know, working in the dining halls, were doing, being maids, were working in the, um, you know, the, the heating and cooling set up, they probably didn't have that much cooling, mostly heating, um, you know, doing that kind of manual labor started to organize as workers were organizing throughout the United States in the second half of the 30s and into the 40s. Um, and he was very much on their side and he had gotten to know people in New Haven. He cared about the city a lot. And uh, he was out there on the front lines of their organization. And then when he graduated, his first job was to be a paid organizer, what the only one for this Yale local. Um, so, you know, he, he I, the way I described this uh, was a dynamic that he established at Yale that really carried through his whole career, which was that, you know, he felt like he was, um, you know, a, a rebel in the belly of the establishment beast is the way I put it. That's, those are my words, but he would be part of, you know, the kind of ruling class, if you will, but that he felt it was his responsibility to, to identify the flaws and to make it better. And that was a dynamic he played. He didn't look for alternatives. He wanted to be right in the center of where the power was, but then he wanted to make changes that he deeply believed in. I thought that was such an important part of the, the early portion of the book that really did carry through. It, it really sets up nicely a sort of consistency from Loeb that sets him uh, maybe apart from other what we would call elite actors at this time, because he really does authentically seem to care. It doesn't always work out, of course, but he does authentically seem to have a very sort of uh, authentic liberal uh, views on trying to help people. When he says planning with people, sometimes it's messy, but he really means it. And he's not just doing it. He's not just going to plow through people uh, in the long run. He's, he's willing to learn lessons. And, and uh, we'll see, I, I'm sure, as we move ahead, how that, that flexibility or, or that ability to evolve uh, mattered as well. But I do think there's a kind of interesting contradiction at the heart of it, which is that, um, yes, he has very clear ideas about what would make for Ameri a better American society. And race was very much at the heart of it. He felt deeply about that issue. He felt that um, racial inequity was really um, the, a problem that white people needed to take on. It was should not be pushed onto black people. Um, and that goes all the way back to those years uh, in, in college. But then when he was in India, 
He was very much affected by that. Um, so he, you know, and he had it. So he also had a vision that people, we should have people living, if people live together, mixed by class and race and age, because that became an important dimension, we would have a, just a more accepting and, um, you know, liberal society in the ways that he valued. On the, so that's on the one side. On the other side, and this was kind of an inheritance, I think, from the New Deal to some extent, um, he believed in expertise. And uh, he felt that there were people like him who had knowledge. He was a lawyer, not a planner, but he was very much in these jobs that were where he was responsible for much planning and redevelopment. Um, and he felt that, that he had an expertise that mattered. And so there was a kind of contradiction between how do you have, you know, a society where everybody, you know, is kind of as an equal place, and yet you also value expertise. And there were many moments when there was a clash between those values. And it took a long time for him to really reconcile that. And it meant dialing back, ultimately, the confidence and expertise, because and recognizing that there was a kind of knowledge that residents had of their own communities that no expert would ever be able to understand. It's a really important uh, point and it, it comes through, you, there are times in the book when you're reading and, and you just feel this ebullience of, especially early in New Haven, and you see uh, him and you see Mayor uh, Dick Lee, and they, they're just, they seem to be doing everything right. And as you say, they're, they're going to beat the suburbs at their own game. And here again, you see them responding to the Consumers Republic, basically. Uh, yeah. and, and you get excited and, and you're reading and you're enthusiastic, and then it keeps going and you see communities showing up at meetings and saying, hold on, you've been ignoring us for years. You've been, um, how uh, in the early years should we assess the sort of very liberal, it, it seems you say, uh, for example, Mayor Lee is sort of a John F. Kennedy-like figure, right? And it, how should we assess that energy and enthusiasm? And it, it seems like they really are authentically trying to help minority communities. He's constantly co uh, polling African-Americans and they seem to be on board. And yet a few years later, uh, the community sh shows up and says, you've been ignoring us. Our, our neighborhoods are still in disrepair. Um, what went wrong? Was it that obsession with expertise early on or was there more to it than that? Well, <laughs> very complicated, obviously, issue. And I'm very glad you felt some of that uh, emotionally yourself as a reader that, you know, you sort of were cheering them on and then you start to realize that it isn't quite what it may appear because that was one of my objectives. I really wanted to try to get people beyond these stereotypes um, and, and also to recognize that, you know, that, that, that people who cared about the survival of cities in the 1950s in particular um, really struggled and I wanted to try to put the, the reader back in that moment and, and have the reader have to face the limited options and the availability of federal money, which came with it certain requirements like demolition rather than renovation and rehabilitation. There were certain things you just, that was built into the, the housing acts that you had to do. Eventually those laws liberalized and you could spend the money to rehabilitate buildings rather than tear them down and put something else up. So there were those constraints. But I did, you know, the, the, I wanted people to recognize that, you know, they really felt the impact of the development of shopping malls uh, in the, the suburban areas of New Haven, when New Haven had been the retail center for that whole part of Southern Connecticut and even Southern New England to some extent. Um, so what did they, what were their choices? Well, they thought, well, if we, we need to put in department stores and shopping malls and parking, that's very convenient where people feel safe and it's accessible and they no longer are just going to run to the suburban shopping malls. Because as you said, they polled all the time and they were very alarmed to discover that it wasn't just suburbanites who were going to those shopping malls, but New Haven residents we're saying, you know what, it's a lot easier not to go downtown. There's lots of traffic, the streets are too narrow, the parking is impossible, 
you know, it's just the stores are kind of fading. So they, they saw that. So their idea was, okay, well, we'll put a shopping mall downtown, which is not, you know, an unreasonable uh, alternative to them. And then, of course, when they did, were so excited to lure Macy's to New Haven, the, uh, Strauss, the president of Macy's, said, you know, we're only coming because you put that, shop, that parking garage right by, right directly attached to the Macy's store, and that there is that highway that goes right into the, into the parking garage, because we're really not going anywhere in a city that doesn't have that. So there were, that was a constraint as well. The stores had a lot of power. So they really had you know, to, to, to deal with these pressures. And I wanted the reader to experience that. On the other hand, I do conclude that by the, you know, the, the end of urban renewal of New Haven, it was not successful for a lot of reasons. Um, and one of them was that lack of full participation of the residents. But here it's important to pick up on what you were saying about the African-American community, because they had a model of community participation that was, I call pluralist democracy, which was that they basically consulted with the leaders of established organizations. And that was, you know, business and it was labor and it was church groups and it was illegal women, women voters, but it was also the NAACP and, you know, many other African-American organizations. It, and I, if you can look at a photograph of this group that they consulted with, there are African Americans in that. The pushback that came by the mid 1960s was not those African Americans. It was much more sort of ordinary people who had been the victims of urban renewal. So in fact, within the African American community, there was not one voice. There were, there were divisions that were built around class and around age and around, you know, sort of access to power. And there was a kind of rejection of the black leadership along with the white leadership of the town. Because Dick Lee was really known as quite a racial progressive. He appointed the first African-American attorney to the city of New Haven. They, they, they were, there were blacks in his administration, but they were not you know, people in the Hill District who were feeling the, you know, that they were kind of victims of urban renewal. So again, I'm trying here to break down these very simplistic notions that there was one black position and one white position and you know and, and and city hall and neighborhoods but it's really a more complicated story and you know i wanted to try to get at that and new haven did give me that opportunity because it was so well documented including by a very important book of political science called um, who governs by Robert Dahl, that was really a an on the ground uh, case study of urban renewal in New Haven. And for it, he did many, many dozens of interviews, all of which he deposited at Yale also in manuscripts and archives. And he was still alive when I was working on this and gave me permission to, con to consult those interviews, which were tremendously useful. Well, it's... It What's very interesting about this uh, throughout the book, and, and I'll talk about this later also when I ask you uh, for our mostly New York uh, interested audience about comparisons with Moses, but I'll, I'll put that aside for, for the moment. One of the many brilliant contributions of this book is to break down this, all the sort of dichotomies about this kind of history, whether it's the city versus the grassroots, or I think something you also point out very importantly, it's not as though participatory democracy is always going to mean progressive interests being heard, because while you tell that story, we see both in New Haven and in Boston, uh, Logue's next stop, that a lot of the grassroots opposition to the liberal centralized planners uh, is coming from reactionaries or, or from segregationists. Um, and I, I think that's a really important uh, contribution as well. Um, how did that kind of tension um, make the story that you were trying to tell even more complicated? Did, did it just make it sort of invite you to 
sort of break down the, the sort of superficial dichotomies or, or did it make the, the world messier? And how did it make things messier? Uh, you tell it very well, but for, for our viewers, how did it make things messier for Logue himself and for the various politicians he was working with? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, again, we have this tendency post Jane Jacobs to, um, you know, kind of romanticize that community input. And, and today you couldn't do any kind of redevelopment project without public meetings and public hearings and lots of participation. And, you know, all that is good, but we shouldn't kid ourselves that it's necessarily democracy at work because, you know, we know there's <clears throat> studies that have been done, for example, about who goes to a public meeting. They tend to be wealthier, they tend to be older. Uh, you know, it, 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 there is a, a way in which some groups have more influence than others. And so I do find all the way through that some of the community pressure is, is in, the, in a, what we would consider today probably a positive direction, but not always. And so in New Haven, there are people who are very much resist the efforts to put um, infill housing in middle-class neighborhoods. Uh, that people who resist the integration of the New Haven schools. Um, and then when in Boston, there are plenty of uh, pushbacks against, you know, efforts that Logue made to uh, racially and income wise integrate communities. And of course, the culmination of this comes in the New York chapters when as part of Logue's work on the state level for the Urban Development Corporation, he's ecstatic that finally he's going to be operating at the state level and he can take on an issue that he tried to battle in New Haven, in Boston, everywhere, which was that suburbs were kind of an escape from the problems of the city. And he wanted suburbs to have to help deal with the problems of housing and schooling and uh, employment that many urban, poor urban residents struggled with. And yet he could never get there. The, the suburbs were escapist in New Haven, they were escapist in Boston. And he thought, well, now I'm no longer being contained by the boundaries of the city. I can, with my statewide authority, really push the suburbs into participation. And so he started something called the Fair Share Housing Program. And the first place they were going to do this was in Westchester County, where the idea was to put 100 units of affordable housing in nine suburban communities in Westchester. Well, you can just imagine how well that went. Um, and uh, it did not go very well. And, and it, it ultimately contributed substantially, which we can talk about later, to the demise of the UDC as Logue knew it and wanted it to be. So, you know, I think I'm trying to show that we should not blind ourselves to the complexity of community involvement and assume that it's always going to be for the values of racial and income integration, not at all. Um, and you unleash a lot, uh, you know, but, you know, and here's where Logue would then say, but I know best. Uh, and yet that's not a winning strategy either. That's right. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting throughout your book, and you talked at the beginning about your interest in the built environment, um, the sort of combination of architecture and design and political and social aspirations. And it's something that I, I, maybe we take it for granted because we just associate certain styles with certain moments in history, but it, it's, it's, it's so powerful the way it's presented here from Logue's perspective and in each of these moments. So I, I want to ask you um, about, you know, why does a parking garage in New Haven need to be, quote, monumental? Uh, and then later on, you talk about uh, the, the modernism. I mean, the best, of course, is uh, the Boston uh, city uh, center. Tell me about how architecture factors into these plans and, and these designs. Yeah, I mean, it started in New Haven, where, you know, Lee, Mayor Lee and Ed Logue were faced with a city that uh, basically had a Victorian era downtown, some even earlier than that, 
and narrow streets and seemed very uh, kind of outdated and uh, tired. And they very much wanted to convey that New Haven was up to date and future oriented. And one of the ways that they felt they could do that was to build um, sort of cutting edge modern architecture uh, in their renewal. And Yale was doing some of the same thing. There was a lot of innovative modern architecture going up at Yale, particularly the museums, the science uh, buildings. Yale was really broadening its um, traditional orientation to the humanities to include the sciences in the post-war period when there was a lot of government money that was going into uh, R&D for science and uh, so forth. So they wanted to be a part of that. So, you know, modernism was really a very important statement to them, though they at first were not very involved in any decision-making about what that should look like. They just wanted modern. But they learned kind of the hard way that bad modern architecture does not really help your profile. So the first building to go up on this highway that connected downtown New Haven to the new Interstate 95, it was called the Connector, was a new, the, new, the Southern New England Telephone Company uh, phone headquarters. And uh, there they discovered that they, the building that went up was panned in the architectural press as one the architectural forum said something like a building that looks like it was designed by the janitor. So they were, you know, they were very much uh, embarrassed. And so when, Bo when Lowe got to Boston, he decided he really needed to take more seriously what the, the design of these buildings. And so one of the first things he did was to set up a design advisory board. Um, and on it were the two deans of the architecture schools of Harvard and MIT, uh, as well. It was chaired by the head of the architecture department at, at, at Harvard, and it had some other prominent architects on it. So quality started to matter. Um, the, the government center in Boston, and whose centerpiece is the Boston City Hall, still a very controversial building, kind of brutalist uh, building was actually a competition that uh, Loeb was really half-hearted about running, but uh, the mayor, John Collins, felt it was very important to have a competition because what he feared was that it would be like everything in Boston, you know, um, an alliance of pals, you know, and Pauls, <laughs> you know, and that it would go to you know, the usual suspects. So he thought it was really important that there be a blind competition for the city hall building. And when it was, this, this design won out by a board that was specially appointed to review the submissions, the mayor himself was rather aghast because it was a very modernist building. It was made out of concrete. It didn't look anything like what city halls are thought to look like with traditional sort of uh, architecture. He gulped and said, you know, it's going to be a great building. It will live on in history. And it has. It's still there. Um, so, you know, Logue came to really admire architects, to care a lot about design. And when he gets to the UDC in New York, he it takes a lot of pride in putting together kind of a, a stable of architects who are both well-established people and young up-and-coming architects. He has a lot of design review. He has live-ins, which we can talk about, but he takes it very seriously. Um, in some moments, I felt he would have loved to have been an architect. And Nelson Rockefeller, of course, was a similar kind of person uh, who himself would have liked, truly would have wanted to be an architect if he wasn't born to the family he was born to. Um, when Lowe got to the South Bronx, though, to a very kind of, um, you know, underfunded, scrappy organization that was trying to build housing that would appeal to lower middle class people to jumpstart the, reno the sort of rehabilitation of a very poor neighborhood around Charlotte Street. It became clear that they had to build the kind of architecture he was not proud of. Prefab, single family, suburban style houses that many of these people of color in 
the, the Bronx, who would have loved to live in the suburbs if they could afford it and if they would have been allowed to live there. There's still a lot of discrimination. Um, and he just kind of held his nose and built that kind of housing, recognizing that that was not his top priority. Making housing that people wanted to live with and would be committed to was more important. Um, and so he, and he also learned because in that era, government support was really cu being cut tremendously under Reagan, um, that it really, it almost took um, the public purse to make, to build innovative architecture because traditional tastes might really win out if the private sector was making all the decisions. That's, um, I actually, uh, you mentioned Rockefeller and I, I want to uh, bring Logue and Rockefeller together in a moment. But before we do that, I just want to ask briefly about his failed mayoral campaign on his way, basically on his way out of Boston, as it turns out, at least for the moment. Um, I get the sense, I think you say it explicitly, he, he was not a good politician. Uh, and was his heart in it or was he just, he didn't understand what he was getting into? I mean, it seems to be pretty, I won't say disastrous, but it, it's a failed campaign. Um, is there anything that we can learn from that? This is an only foray into electoral politics, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's interesting. I mean, it, this was a case where I could dig deeper into uh, behind what he said. He said, the story that he told over and over again, and he gave a million interviews over the years. And, and so he, as, as everyone does, he kind of developed certain stock answers that he would give. And the stock answer on why he ran for mayor was that one day in kind of the winter or spring of 67, he went in to see John Collins and John, the mayor, and John Collins said, you know, Logue, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not running again. Um, I'm done. And Logue said, you can't, this is his version, you can't do that. We're not done yet. And John Collins then apparently said, according to Logue's story, well, you'll never be done, Ed. Uh, why don't you run? So that was the, the stock answer. But in fact, I found in his papers and in his letters and correspondence, a lot of indications that the idea had crossed his mind many years before that. And you know, he, in the last kind of year or two, he started doing the kinds of things that politicians do, writing, you know, condolence notes, and um, you know, going, getting himself around a lot, and calling in favors and that kind of thing. And he did have, get a lot of support from architects and builders, um, and he was identified as a progressive candidate. But he, what happened was that Louise Day Hicks was really the front runner. And she, for those of your viewers who don't know, was very clearly identified as a segregationist, um, defending kind of the, the, the white schools and, and segregation of those schools and the whites of Boston City, uh, the school committee, um, and it's sort of a power to keep schools segregated. And the more liberal, part of Boston was very alarmed. And there were 10 candidates in this election. Um, and three of them were all living in Beacon Hill, Ed being one, uh, and um, Kevin White, who ultimately won, who was the Secretary of State for, the, for Massachusetts, um, was another, and there was a, a third uh, person. And they, the, the kind of liberal wing decided we better unite around one candidate or Louise Day Hicks is going to waltz in. And the way Boston elections happen is there is a runoff in September and it's nonpartisan. There's not one candidate for a party. And then there's a runoff of the top two candidates in November. And so they really felt they needed to, to join forces around one of those candidates. And it turned out to be Kevin White. There also was a, a major mistake that Logue made and he later regretted um, deeply, which was that he, he knew that Kevin White was the person who he needed to knock out. And he and his team felt they had a case to make that there were fraudulent signatures on some of the petitions that Kevin White's uh, campaign had put forward. 
Uh, but the way they went about showing that was they got somebody who was ultimately tracked down to being on the, in the low camp to challenge it. And that was then discovered. And so it looked very bad for Loeb, like he had kind of been trying to entrap Kevin White. So all of this, you know, worked against him. You know, and whether he really wanted it, I think he really wanted it. I am not necessarily for the power, though he certainly liked being at the center of attention. I think it was really because he had a vision of what he wanted Boston to be. And he didn't know who he would work for if John Collins wasn't mayor. Um, certainly Kevin White wouldn't have kept him on heading the Boston Redevelopment Authority, nor would probably have any of the other candidates. So, you know, he thought this was a, a viable strategy. He never tried it again. And, and I did hear from many of the people I interviewed who had worked with him in Boston that he was a terrible campaigner. I mean, he just was too blunt. He, he never, he didn't make small talk easily. In a, one person I interviewed said he walked around the, the, the North End, the Italian neighborhood with him and people would come up to him and introduce themselves and he would just say, I'm Ed Logue. And he would then pull him aside and say, ask them about themselves, you know, tell them, you know, what it is you like to do, how you're going to make life better for them. He just, just didn't come naturally. It's, it's interesting. So uh, it, it is probably, as I'm thinking back, it was one of the only moments, maybe the only moment uh, when he seemed to be almost petty was when he went after Kevin White or when his people did uh, throughout the book. Um, and maybe that was a case of being such a poor campaigner and, and just doing desperate, foolish things, sort of flailing about. Um, but it turned out, as, as you suggest, he wasn't going to work for any of the mayors. Uh, he was going to work for Nelson Rockefeller. Um, and Rockefeller, as you mentioned earlier, was uh, sort of an architecture aficionado. Uh, many of our uh, viewers are uh, familiar with Albany. And so you, you need only look around uh, Empire State Plaza to see his love of brutalist architecture and, and uh, modernism. Um, I remember the first time driving to Albany and just and there's a point from the highway when you think you're approaching like a space station or something. It's just a, it's a, it's a really a, a very uh, monumental vision. Um, and so I guess in some ways his views and Rockefeller's aligned. You talk about Logue's relationship with each of the politicians that he was connected with. And you say that he and Lee, they, they had a lot of similar values and um, you say that it was a sort of fraternal uh, relationship. And then with Collins, Collins was more of a, of a paternal relationship. Um, but characterize and discuss uh, his relationship with Governor Rockefeller. I would say it was probably the, the least intimate of those three. I think they respected each other tremendously and Logue depended on Rockefeller to, to sort of protect the UDC and his work, which worked as long as Rockefeller was governor. But of course, when he stepped down, then it, it was more problematic not to have him there. Um, I do think they shared uh, not just a love for architecture, but a, a sort of understanding and a commitment they felt, uh, right or wrong, that physical improvements and physical um, inter interventions could have much larger social impact. So that it was really a social policy, not just an aesthetic policy or an architectural policy um, or an economic policy. I mean, they really felt it was going to do good. Um, and I did learn a lot more about Rockefeller recently that isn't even in the book, in that I was asked to give a keynote at a conference uh, in Cologne on uh, urban studies in the Americas and the interactions between North and South America uh, in the post-war period. And that gave me an opportunity to investigate something that I had noticed when I was doing my research, but hadn't really investigated, which was that 
Um, in every place that Logue worked, um, he, in, he worked with people who had had a similar kind of involvement in the developing world as he had in India. Um, but in most of the other cases, it was in Latin America. And that was true with his, with someone he worked with very closely, uh, Ralph Taylor in New Haven. It was true of Sert in uh, the, one of the, the dean of the Harvard School of Design in Boston. And in New York, it was certainly true of Rockefeller who had had both public roles as Under Secretary of State and in some other positions, first Roosevelt appointed him, then Truman appointed him. Um, and also he had worked it for a private planning company that he had established in Latin America. So he had been very engaged in a lot of these issues um, and in the public and the private sector, which I concluded in doing this paper had been influential in his decision to set up the Urban Development Corporation to be a kind of a hybrid public-private partnership. Uh, he also was a Republican who believed uh, in the power and the good that the private sector could do, but there was also this experience that he'd had in Latin America. And, and also there was, he had um, very, a lot of contact with architects and planners who worked in Latin America, particularly a man named Maurice Rodeval, who was a planner, the, the, the sort of key planner in New Haven. He taught at Yale and he had done a plan for New Haven and Loeb used him as his firm, his consulting firm as the planners for, the, for New Haven. The same time he was deeply involved in New Haven, he was also deeply involved in Caracas, Venezuela. And his plans for some of the uh, redevelopment of Caracas actually influenced the Empire State Plaza that Rockefeller built in Albany. So there were some very interesting connections there. It's interesting. I, it, a brief follow up because you mentioned very early in the, the book that you know Logue had this a couple of, a brief stint working for Chester Bowles in India, and you said historians have done a lot of work on how New Dealers went overseas and took those ideas in global development, but they haven't looked enough at how those people who had gone overseas brought those ideas back. And so you've, you've shown one example. Uh, in general, with Logue's career um, and, and maybe others that, that you just mentioned, how did those overseas development projects inspire what they did back in the US? Well, definitely his India experience when he worked for Chester Bowles, who was ambassador to India for, he worked for about a year and a half for him in the early 50s, and then came back to New Haven and took on this job directly. And a lot of the other people he worked with um, were influenced by this, this community development work that was both government supported with the Point Four program um, and also uh, Ford Foundation money. So it was this kind of connection. But throughout his career, he was very much part of transnational conversations about planning. And you can see in, in New York State um, some of that impact. So for example, the new town approach, which uh, Logue was a great fan of, and he did two in upstate New York, one outside of Syracuse, one outside of Buffalo, and then uh, Roosevelt Island in New York in the East River, which was his sort of crown jewel project for the UDC. Those were very much influenced by the new town um, concept that took off in Europe in the post-war period as European countries, whether it was the UK or France or Germany or Scandinavia, um, as they recovered from World War II, they had this notion of a, of a, of a community that would be, would be both residents and work. It would also be leisure, recreation, consumption there as well, these self-contained communities. And that very much influenced Logue uh, when he was working at the UDC. Um, so he, he learned a lot from kind of other things that were happening in other places. Um, and as he arrives in New York, as he decides to come to New York, uh, there's something that you, uh, you, you talk about it for a couple of pages, 
Um, and we recently actually have an article uh, in New York history about Rockefeller's use of money. And, and, and you mentioned, we find out so much when he's having these hearings to become vice president about sort of how much money he was using sort of in his own sort of side deals. And there's a lot of that with Loeb. If you could talk a little bit, because it's just fascinating uh, about his sort of courtship of Logue and and some of the some of the benefits that Logue receives for coming to New York on Rockefeller's well I mean it's not on Rockefeller's terms Logue <laughs> helps rewrite the legislation but how how Rockefeller gets him to, to, to come yeah I mean it, it is a kind of courtship and uh, at a an event years later that uh, Logue is at and people are talking about Rockefeller they all kind of laugh about how he courted them. And when he, when Ro Nelson Rockefeller wanted something, he was determined to get it. And so he first, Logue had just, he, he had given up the BRA position to run for mayor. He lost the mayoral race. And, uh, and then he's kind of at a loss in the fall of 67. He gets a kind of visiting position at BU, Boston University. Um, for a year and he's kind of gets ensconced in an office at BU. And then he, his secretary uh, who was remained with him for many years um, and who actually just died in her nineties, uh, comes into the office and says, the governor's on the phone. And he said, well, what governor? She says, Nelson Rockefeller. This was a call completely out of the blue. And it's Nelson Rockefeller saying to Logue, I'm working up some legislation. I'd like your input. Can you come down to New York? And Logue said, well, when? He said, how about tomorrow? So Logue goes um, and he, he meets with Rockefeller's closest staff and ultimately with Nelson himself and looks at this legislation for the Urban Development Corporation. And he says to Nelson Rockefeller, you know, this is pretty good, pretty good, but it won't work. And Nelson Rockefeller says, why not? Why won't it work? And he said, because you do not have a way of protecting yourself from a mayor like Mayor Lindsay, uh, who might decide he didn't want you playing in his backyard. Uh, you need more power of, to override local zoning uh, and building codes if you're gonna get this to work. And later on, Logue admits that uh, in some of the interviews that he gave that he, he was pretty manipulative in pointing to, to John Lindsay because he knew how much antagonism there was between John Lindsay and Nelson Rockefeller. Um, they were both liberal Republicans. They both wanted to be president of the United States. And they were, you know, typical upstate, downstate, you know, there, that's a, a given in New York State, as all of your viewers probably know. But, you know, it had a personal tinge to it in this case. And so, of course, that got Nelson's attention. And they went back to the drawing board. They built into the legislation this enormous power to override local zoning, which it is ultimately uh, was very hard to get through the state legislature. They did. But then when the fair share housing uh, problem exploded, it gave the, the people who had always opposed that power the chance to get back at Logue and the UDC and Nelson Rockefeller. So anyway, so when... Logue is then asked by Rockefeller to come and be the president and CEO of this Urban Development Corporation. He says, you know, I don't know about that. Um, I have a $60,000 debt from my, uh, my mayoral race, uh, which I would have a very hard time paying off if I leave Boston. Um, also, my family is very happy in Boston and we go to the vineyard in the summer. And, um, you know, I just don't know. And then, but Nelson had decided that Ed Logue was his man. And he said, I'll pay off your campaign debt. And I'll also lend you the money to buy a very nice co-op apartment in New York and end up to be on East End Avenue. Um, and you can gradually pay me back for that. And so when the vice presidential hearings took place, it turned out, as, as you know, that he had lent a lot of influential people money, um, which he didn't think was unethical. You know, he was trying to figure out 
how to get the, the talent that he wanted to do the work he thought was important. Uh, Logue didn't have to pay. He paid off the campaign debt. That was easily done. He had only paid back a small amount of that loan uh, by the time of those hearings. Um, and then ultimately he did sell that apartment and I assume the, the debt was repaid at that point. Um, the rivalries between Lindsay and Rockefeller and the way that Logue gets caught up in them at times is just sort of a, it, it's always fun to, to read more about that, including when they finally get this memorandum of understanding between uh, the mayor and the governor and the UDC, and they have the signing ceremony at Gracie Mansion, and Rockefeller basically blows the whole thing up by just insulting Lindsay. Um, it's, just a, it's just a fun moment in the book. I don't know if there's any follow-up there, except I guess to ask um, one more about uh, Rockefeller uh, before we move on. You've characterized him in the book uh, pretty uh, clearly as a liberal Republican. I think that's a, a fairly accepted um, understanding of him, certainly uh, compared to a lot of other Republicans in his moment and later on. Um, and yet there are, and you mentioned, uh, there, there is a sort of shift uh, and there's been sort of a reassessment of Rockefeller and people talk about some of the drug laws, they talk about Attica, et cetera. Um, overall, before we move on to, to the UDC, uh, based on what you've looked at, um, what would your overall assessment of understanding Nelson Rockefeller as a, as a state level figure, uh, it still holds up as broadly a, a liberal Republican, is, is that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think he's a complicated figure. And like, once again, I'm trying to complicate things, not just reduce them to the simplest explanation. And certainly his reputation has been tarnished by Attica and the mandatory sentencing laws. But I think we have to understand that he was getting a lot of pressure from conservatives in the Republican Party. So, you know, he was a Republican. Uh, and, and so that was certainly a factor. And so some of that moving to the right on those issues was, I think, very much the state of politics in New York, um, where this was not an easy uh, road to hoe. Um, so that's, that's one thing I would say. I mean, he also ultimately did get tripped up by his belief that you could have these public-private partnerships and they could work. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very careful to kind of try to understand why the UDC sort of fell apart. Um, and there were a lot of reasons. And part of it did go back to the way that, Rose, that, that Rockefeller set it up uh, with these um, moral obligation bonds, which was the only way he could get these bonds to work because um, a normal kind of bond needed to get the support of the voters of New York State who repeatedly were rejecting the bond issues that, that Rockefeller tried to float to build subs uh, subsidized housing in the state, which he desperately thought the state needed. He also knew that many of these cities, particularly upstate, but New York wasn't doing terribly well, were suffering terribly from deindustrialization and decline and they needed resources. So because he had this kind of faith in the private sector and he had a brother, David Rockefeller, you know, at the helm of one of the most powerful banks, he, you know, he really thought he could make it work. And, and when, you know, he had already exited from the scene and the UDC kind of collapsed, many journalists and analysts went back and looked at the situation to try to figure out what went wrong. And many of them concluded that it was really an impossible a mission. That, you know, you just, if you're gonna do, you know, public good, like build subsidized housing and try to turn around cities that are in decline, you just have to accept it's gotta be public money. And to try to, fund it by the sale of private bonds was ultimately doomed. And because what happened was as New York State got into a terrible financial situation and interest rates were going through the roof in the early 1970s, the investors were, um, you know, becoming more and more uh, unhappy 
with the fact that Loeb was just doing what he was doing and not taking seriously enough, they thought, his responsibility to his investors. They had invested, you know, not just for public good, but to get return on their dollars. And so there were many analysts who felt that the, the proposition was really flawed. It's interesting because Loeb, you, you have this, I think it's a wonderful quote early on where he says, you can't trust the private sector to protect the public interest. And by now he's signing on to this sort of different uh, funding scheme. It's a different period at that point, right? Does he really have any choice? The federal government is rolling things back, especially uh, you make much, uh, and I think rightly, of uh, Nixon's uh, sort of new federalism idea. And so the federal government is uh, backing out. But even before that, uh, the state government, uh, Rockefeller can't get voters to approve it. Um, and it's funny, as I was reading that, I'll just say parenthetically, it reminded me um, of that there's so many uh, moments when governors want to fund things and they can't get around either legislative or quirky constitutional roadblocks. And so they have to come up with some other mechanism. Uh, and, and I know like in the 20s, uh, Smith was like, I'm tired of having one bond every year for some project. We're just gonna have a 10 year bond. We're gonna get it approved. We're gonna have as much, we're gonna have like a hundred million dollars, which is a ton back then. Uh, and they have to come up with something innovative. And it, it feels like Rockefeller's facing the same pressures. So is, has Logue evolved or is he just saying, look, I get it. We're not going to have as much public money as we used to. This is the best I can do right now. Because you're right. You, you make very clear. He's not now like, OK, we've got to make sure we pay off these bonds and make our investors happy. He's still his heart's still in the same place. Right. And, and oh, so yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he thinks, oh, well, first of all, he's by 68 when he becomes president of UDC. Uh, the Vietnam War had was really cutting into domestic spending. It was under Johnson, so it's you know it's even before Nixon, and you know he was really struggling with how to do the things he wanted to do. So in some ways, he just kind of held his nose and thought, well, you know, let's try this approach. It at least it gives me money to play with, um, and hope for the best. And he sort of thought Rockefeller would be there to protect him. And he ran it as if he didn't have those bankers uh, on his tail. And for a while, they were happy enough. You know, he, he basically ran it as if all the money was coming from Washington anyway. Um, but then when things weren't going so well, uh, he was facing a lot more pressure. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think he changed. I think he just thought... The times are changing. And one of the points that I'm really trying to make in the book is that we can't just dismiss all urban interventions from, you know, 1949 to, you know, 1980, 2000 as the same thing. Urban renewal, all bad. I mean, it just is much more complicated and evolving. And someone like Logue, I try to say, was very skillful at trying to adapt to changes in policy in Washington and state government, money that was available from new sources, that you know there were ways in which um, urban redevelopment improved as a result of some of the disasters like New Haven. Uh, they got better at it. They made mistakes. They adjusted. There was community criticism. So by the time he got to the South Bronx, the scale was obviously much smaller, but he was much more open to community involvement. Uh, he was trying to figure out how to work with private sector lenders because that was the name of the game under Reagan. Um, so there was just a kind of adaptability there that we need to take into account. One thing that he seemed to understand uh, very well uh, upon arrival in New York was something you mentioned a moment ago, the upstate downstate balance. Uh, and he seemed to be very intentional in making sure that these projects and the, and the the fruits of the UDC, uh, what you describe as, as a whirlwind of, of building early on, uh, were, were well distributed. Um, it's interesting because we'll talk about Roosevelt Island in a moment, but uh, the impact on the deindustrializing upstate communities, the sort of the what, what's the part of the Rust Belt, right? The sort of old Erie Canal corridor. 
Um, how much of an influence were his projects able to have up there? You, you mentioned two of the new towns are near Syracuse and Buffalo, for example, but, but other things in uh, Rochester, the facelift for Newburgh that you mentioned, uh, that's, that's Hudson Valley, but um, how much- Ithaca, that, like, um, yeah, 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 right. uh, you know, the Niagara Falls, they built a convention center to give an economy to Niagara Falls year round. Um, Hurricane Agnes had done a lot of damage in upstate New York. They, Rockefeller looked to the UDC to repair a lot of that and try to do some flood control. I think they had a big Rochester, had a lot of housing. I think there was a very serious commitment to spreading this around. And, and I'm sure Rockefeller made it clear that that was a necessity, that the UDC's survival depended on, on keeping friends uh, in those places. Um, and, you know, because so, there was this alliance between upstate legislators and New York City legislators against the UDC, you know, uh, and fearing that it was all going to go elsewhere. Um, so I do think they did a lot. In the beginning, in those first months, I describe how Logue and his team had a, a little plane and they flew around and they would, you know, land in Buffalo, meet with the mayor, uh, you know, and then see what the, the needs were there. And they basically were saying to many of these upstate mayors, um, you know, we're here at your service. What do you need? And they needed a lot. Uh, and it, it really protected them uh, because they saw, you know, they, they might have, or even their legislators might have opposed the concept, but they saw it benefiting their community. So it was very important to spread it around. The big uh, place that at first did not get any money was New York City, because Lindsay was so opposed to this meddling, he thought, by Rockefeller, that he said to Logue, you know, you're not doing anything in my backyard without my approval. And so New York City didn't come to the UDC. And at a certain point, six months in or so, nine months in, he sent a message through an intermediary to Lindsay and said, you know, we're almost all committed to projects and New York City's not getting any. I know now is the time. And some of Lindsay's uh, team recognized that New York City was in pretty bad shape. They had huge housing needs and that they, they better get over this uh, and, and get their share. And so ultimately there was this memorandum of agreement and it gave New York City and Lindsay a kind of right of review and they could pick the projects and the UDC low got some of what he wanted, which was he wanted New York City to do the clearance. So the UDC would not be accused of that, um, but they would also in return take on some of the sites that New York City had found very difficult to redevelop. Um, and the site that Logue really wanted uh, was, was Welfare Island, which he ultimately renamed Roosevelt Island in the East River, because he had this vision that this could be a self-contained new town that would be the kind of utopia of mixed class, mixed race, mixed age, uh, people who had lived, been at those hospitals who had physical disabilities, could also, they would build housing to keep them there. You know, it was his dream. And so there was a deal that was struck. Well, I, I would love to talk about Roosevelt Island because as, as you just said, he it's you call it the ultimate fulfillment of his utopian vision. You say that uh, in name and conception, uh, and planned memorial, uh, which took until the 21st century actually to be finished, but uh, it paid uh, homage to the New Deal notion that uh, government could help improve lives and make the nation more just. Um, is this, as you say, sort of uh, Ed Logue's crown jewel and, and talk about what goes into it and uh, how it reflects sort of the trajectory of his vision, his career, everything he's learned along the way well, it was uh, a place where he had market rate housing for, you know, middle and to some extent upper middle uh, and heavily subsidized for low and moderate income. Uh, they were not in the same buildings because actually the, the, the money that was coming from the federal government didn't allow that. But 
He was able to have to create institutions like he, the vision included small schools that were dispersed in these buildings, daycares and, and, and first through third and third through fifth. And um, ultimately that changed somewhat, but he saw those places uh, that as those, those schools as centers that could bring people together across these different housing types. Um, he also built a lot of parks and thought recreation would be a place to bring people together. It was also a walking island. There was, it was pedestrian only and there were uh, electric uh, powered buses that would take people from this big parking garage if they had a car. Um, if not, they used public transportation. Um, they would be the sidewalks and the paths or the views of on the one side Manhattan, the other side Queens would be places that people would come together. So he really saw this as a fulfillment of his hope that we could build a more socially integrated American society. Um, there were other technical advances in, in addition to the, uh, the electric buses. There was an underground uh, dispo garbage disposal system that sent everything to a central place. Uh, there were other innovations to try to save money in the construction. Uh, with prefabricated pieces. I mean, it was a really innovative place. He had Sert, the architect who had been on the Boston Design Review Committee, did one of the very big uh, subsidized housing. Uh, he had a senior center in that building. You know, there were just, there was a lot of stuff. And what the subway was supposed to come to, um, from the east side, and connect to Roosevelt Island and go on to Queens. And the stop was not going to be anywhere ready by the time the island was going to be ready to be inhabited. So that's when they came up with this idea of having this cable car that would go across and which became kind of the icon of Roosevelt Island. I should tell you that not too long ago, just a month or two ago, I did a talk for the Roosevelt Island Historical Society and that the local public library branch, they jointly sponsored it um, and spoke to a, a lot of the old timers who still live on Roosevelt Island. And I, they were there in the audience and I got a lot of emails afterwards and it resonated for many people that this was the community they signed on to. A lot has changed today. Um, there's market, a lot of market rate housing now that is very, very different from the old part of Roosevelt Island. You can see it visually. And of course now the, uh, there's a, Cornell is building a new campus in, at the Southern end of the island near where the FDR monument is. The people from, uh, who are part of this kind of old vision of Roosevelt Island feel very good about the, co the engineering school. And they feel that they are very much in sync there building a hotel that they're gonna give them a discount at and it's gonna help with retail, which has always struggled. They feel much less happy about the new residences, which are just kind of cookie cutter, um, modern residences at very high rents. Um, but the old part still has captured a lot of the feeling of what Logue was trying to accomplish. And this is one of the places where they had the live-ins, is that correct? Uh, Everywhere they yeah. did that. And that was, um, again, part of this utopian idea that, um, you know, we can get top architects, but we also need to have input from people who live in these projects. And so in the, right as the projects came to an end, UDC required that staff and the architects, and I don't know how many of them really did it, I know Logan, his wife did three or four of them, um, would have to live for several days in one of these projects to see how it worked. And Margaret Logue uh, told me that she had made several recommendations as a result of her residence. She thought there needed to be a pass-through, for example, in uh, a project they lived in in Yonkers between the kitchen and the dining room so that it wasn't just a solid wall. Uh, Ted Liebman, who is the head architect for the UDC, told me a story about how he had, uh, had his secretary, um, an assistant, 
order the kind of furniture that she would like for a bedroom and then have it delivered to uh, a project that they were doing in upstate. And she ordered, you know, like a big dresser and, uh, you know, a big bed and uh, probably some kind of a closet thing. And none of it fit into these tiny bedrooms. So, you know, then they learned that, you know, that very often the kind of furniture that their tenants might like were not going to fit in these tiny little bedrooms. So they also learned, for example, that they needed to have uh, phone booths in the lobby because not everybody had, you know, a phone, a private phone. Or, you know, people, there were not doormen in some of these buildings. People might need to call up. Um, and so, you know, there were think, a lot of learning that took place and a real openness to that. It's, what I find interesting about this moment for Log and uh, for sort of these ideas in general is it feels like everything is coming together. He's learned the lessons of the past. He... I mean, this is again I, the live-ins. It's a, it's, it's sort of a, a beautiful at its best manifestation of his, the, the sort of purity of his liberal vision, right? If, if me and my wife don't want to live in a place like this, or if we would want things to change, why would we build that for people? Why don't we make these adjustments? Um, the idea that he finally can do metropolitan and regional rather than just within one municipality projects. Uh, the funding is clearly an ominous sign, but maybe this is going to work. He's got Roosevelt Island going. You're feeling very well. And he says, now I can finally get the suburbs to buy in. We're going to go to Westchester and it's the nine towns. And um, this is just, it's a fiasco, isn't it? I mean, yeah. is, is it just the suburbs fighting back? Is it just uh, sort of soft and sometimes not soft segregationism, or is there uh, even more with that fiasco? I mean, uh, obviously the UDC crumbling has other factors, but but Westchester in particular, uh, what does that story tell us? Well, it, it, it actually, I made a, a point about this in Consumers Republic, where I argued that, um, you know, for many Americans, their home ownership was their major asset. Um, and from, you know, World War II on, we were very much promoting the notion of single family homes that would be owned by the resident. So that was kind of the answer to the housing crisis that the United States had after World War II when nothing had been built through the Great Depression and then the war. And the solution was to make mortgages available through the GI Bill. It was also the... Um, other sources. And we know now, you know, this beginning in the 1930s, there was a lot of discrimination, redlining that went on um, because of the way that we moved that money. It went through private banks and they too were trying to preserve their investment. So we made housing very much uh, a, a, a monetary asset. And so it made people very conservative and property values uh, became sort of crucial to what people's wealth and the real estate market has told them over and over again that all white communities are the best investment. Um, and I do think that that contributes greatly. I'm not trying, I also think that there's plenty of racial prejudice uh, around schools, you know, and, but, you know, even when Logue uh, would say to the communities, these nine towns, which, you know, were erupted in, protest, you know, that we're going to have a priority list for this housing. First of all, the housing is going to be low rise. It's going to be like garden apartments. It's going to be very leafy. It's not going to look like, you know, public housing towers. Secondly, the priority will be for people who work in your town, people who teach in your town. Um, it'll be, you know, they were going to prioritize not busloads of people coming from Harlem, which is what people were fantasizing. It was gonna be people who were already invested, people they knew, and still they worried that if you, this was kind of the crack in the wall, if you zoning didn't stay firm, that 
it was going to be all be over. So, you know, zoning and zoning today continues to keep out affordable housing into many suburbs for all of the same reasons. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's a combination of our capitalist um, housing market and racial prejudices um, and, you know, all the other things that lead to the privileges that suburban communities have and the burdens that cities carry. And he was receiving death threats during this? Oh yeah, I mean, he would, many people in my interviews told me about being in his office and he was going that night to a public meeting in Bedford or whatever, Greenberg, and being told, if you come, you know, we're gonna get you and things like that. And he was absolutely undeterred. He, he brought some young staff with him in some of these meetings and they would, Logue would make sure they sat like in the front row like this and made it clear that they were unmoved. And, um, you know, in the end, Rockefeller was, thought this was a good idea at first. Um, you know, he, he said, oh, it's only a hundred units. No one's gonna care about that. That's kind of amazing that Rockefeller didn't realize. But as the opposition mounted, as state legislators and congressmen and everybody was in an uproar when it looked like the Republicans might lose uh, in some of the races of, in, the, in the fall elections over this, Rockefeller first declared a moratorium and then ultimately went along with uh, the state legislature curbing the power to override local zoning in communities other than cities. Cities, they could still keep it, but not in these suburban communities. Um, and so this was uh, one piece of what you call the, the sort of perfect storm that uh, dismantles UDC and, and uh, brings down, at least temporarily, Ed Logue. Um, along with this is, and this is really Nixon's contribution, right, his moratorium uh, in, what is it, January 1973, um, and uh, Rockefeller by the end of 1973 is no longer there. As you had pointed out earlier, as long as Rockefeller was there, maybe all of this could work, but once he's gone, um, and so things are starting to suddenly very quickly uh, unravel for Ed Logue and um, then comes the Moreland hearings and, and uh, talk about his sort of UDC's demise and what we learned from that and what did or did not Logue learn from that? Well, there was this, uh, ins there was an insinuation that he had been corrupt in some way. And uh, so he very much felt like he needed to clear his name. And, you know, there was, in the end, there was clear that there was no evidence at all that he had any personal uh, fallibility in this. It, it was really the ultimate conclusion of the, of the Moreland Act Commission and many of the people who observed this was that the concept itself was pretty flawed, that this was just never going to work that ultimately it, it was unfortunate that New York State had the interest rates were so high, New York State was in trouble. Um, Malcolm Wilson was took over for Rockefeller. He wasn't as effective, he was defeated. Uh, uh, you know, uh, case Governor Kerry came in, he, a Democrat, he wanted a clean house. Loeb felt that he was kind of targeted as the, he was gonna be the, the you know, set up to be the sort of, uh, you know, the victim of, all, of the cleaning house. Um, so, you know, it was overdetermined, um, but, but basically it really, it didn't work though, you know, they did build over 33,000 units of housing. They did a lot of good things. They built these new towns. They um, did turn around some cities that were in trouble. They Logue went to the UDC, I think this is important to say in making my point that he learned from previous mistakes, he did not want to do clearance demolition urban renewal anymore. He knew that had gotten him in trouble in New Haven, it, to the extent they did any of it in Boston, and they had had similar pushback. He did not want to do that, but, which is one of the incentives to build new towns on open land. Nobody you could come if you wanted, nobody was going to feel that their territory was invaded. Um, 
so he was, you know, really determined to uh, to do that. And they also went after open areas in cities that had been abandoned, cleared in urban renewal, and then nothing had ever come to do anything with it. So they only went where they weren't going to run into these old problems. That was that deal they made with Lindsay that they wouldn't do the clearing. So, you know, he had learned from that. Um, so there was a lot of good that came from the museum, and, and many people understood that. And in the book, I, you know, I point to the editorials in the New York Times and Paul Goldberger, who appreciated a lot that the UDC had done, and you know, Roosevelt Island being pointed to as a really model project. So there were good things, but it wasn't a sustainable model, particularly in a time when that federal money was drying up, because one of the the, the shrewd at the time, flawed in retrospect things that Logue did is that he sort of, I say, borrowed from Peter to pay Paul. In order to keep these projects going, he wanted them to go faster. He would, as the money came in from the feds, as he called them, he would use it to finish one project, then get started on the next, knowing there'd be another uh, you know, check coming that would pay for that. And the whole thing would keep rolling as long as there was money. But once the, 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 that stopped, he was left holding the bag and, and it was very problematic. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to ask about fast tracking earlier and, and that it, it seemed innovative and, until there wasn't money anymore. And then it was a, a right. huge problem. Ultimately, it seems like you, you, you conclude that the big problem, or at least one of them was this, un, you say this underlying contradiction between the social mandate and the fiscal mandate. Uh, and it's really fascinating because he does seem to have brought so much education to the UDC. Uh, as you say, you don't want to get into clearance anymore. Uh, not, uh, not only do, is it politically bad, but it's not always uh, necessary or even appropriate. And you also point out uh, that he is more flexible on the heroic architecture. Uh, you talk about sort of low rise, high density. Um, and it's interesting how he does take some things away from this. And he's not this might seem like it, this might seem like he's finished, but he's not. He, he gets a, an encore performance and uh, he gets to go to the South Bronx. And that section I found absolutely fascinating. Um, and I guess parts of it start with uh, Jimmy Carter uh, having a photo op. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, on his way, he was under pressure um, from, you know, the Urban League and a lot of other Democrats people, black leaders to have an urban policy in which he really wasn't doing much with because it was also, he was feeling constraints financially. So they, he was going to speak at the UN and his team routed him on a kind of motorcade through the South Bronx so he could see this, this devastated landscape. And he was pretty alarmed uh, and, and then started throwing around some big figures and programs and New York City got very excited and thought, here's our chance. But ultimately the, the uh, Carter administration didn't really come through. Um, but at that point, the, uh, Mayor Koch was mayor and he felt a lot of pressure from some politicians in the Bronx to follow through at least with a plan and he um, knew about Logue and Logue had his consulting, a, a little consulting business at the time. He hired him on as an advisor and ultimately they went with this very small operation, the South Bronx Development Organization, which would get a tiny bit of money from the federal government every year and he'd have to raise a lot of the rest. But Logue wanted a last act after the UDC and I think he truly saw it as a challenge. Many of the people he worked with at the UDC, which was an enormous operation, over 500 employees, a huge budget every year, thought this was such a come down. How could he possibly work in this you know, makeshift operation, which would have a handful of employees and hardly any money and the city match, whatever the city was giving them a couple city cars and an office in the Bronx and a tiny office in Midtown and that was it. Um, but, you know, Logue thought, I care about these issues. This is a challenge. 
Um, and I also want to be in this work. I want to do this. This matters to me. And so he, he made a go of it. Uh, and in the end, it became a kind of blueprint for a path to turning around this part of the South Bronx. There was something, uh, there was something really poignant about this section also, uh, both for the South Bronx and for Ed Logue, because here, even though it doesn't suddenly become, as you said at the beginning, it, you don't suddenly become, this is an Ed Logue biography, you're rooting for him even more at this point to sort of, I want him to, to write this and to have a, a, a pleasant uh, sort of last hurrah. And the, the level of humility here, as you said, he was in this office. You describe his office when he's working for the UDC in mid, I think it's in Midtown, and he can see up to Westchester Avenue, where he wants to work. Top floors, yeah. It's fantastic. And, and 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 now here he is, as you see, with this sort of ragtag team. Um, I love the comparisons you make between some of his allies earlier and who his allies are in the South Bronx. You've got this group, the Desperados. Uh, in Boston, he had been working with cardinals, and now he's working with these humble grassroots parish priests. I mean, it's such a different world. Uh, and, and they're able to accomplish some things, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, at a much smaller scale. Um, but he also, he's changed. The country has changed. The times are different, um, you know, and, and that's why I, you know, I think it's really important to see somebody over a longer period of time and not just to, to push everything uh, together. I mean, ultimately, he's limited in what he can do by the lack of funding. And even the couple million dollars a year he got from the federal government is taken away under Reagan and given to a very corrupt politician in the Bronx who was promised to deliver the presidential vote to Reagan. Um, and, you know, that's kind of uh, the end, except that he is ready to quit, but the people who are about to move into this Charlotte Gardens, uh, the subsidized housing, single family houses, beg him to stay on to see those houses finished. And he does stay on longer because he ultimately cares to make it successful. Um, I'm just very happy to hear that you kind of have a, get, had an emotional reaction to, you know, you don't know as a writer whether people are going to do this. And people have told me that, you know, despite their own political inclinations, they, they couldn't believe it, but that they were actually sympathizing with a character like this, um, which is, to my mind, a success that I have gotten people to see gray where they only saw black and white before. Well, I think that is one of the many wonderful contributions of this book uh, is that it really is breaking down those black and white assessments that are all too common in the history of cities and in the history of, of this kind of political and social uh, history. And frankly, in a lot of the conversations we're having today about these policies, I mean, it, it is, that's not especially productive um, or uh, historically, uh, it's, it's probably not very enlightening. Um, and I think that brings up a something that you bring up in the introduction, and he's sort of in the background at times throughout this story, that brings up Robert Moses. And the way we look at Robert Moses, and you lament early on how the Moses historiography has sort of poison the way people think about this story. Moses once in a while weighs in on Logue. I know he piles on during the Westchester fiasco. <laughs> Moses shows up, he's like, oh, he shouldn't have done that. But, but other times Logue is like, I don't want to be another Moses. Um, I, I really did appreciate so much the, the complex story that you tell. And I'm wondering if you can compare the Logue story to what we know of Moses, not only comparing his career to Moses' career, I mean, that's fine, but also more how we approach this history, looking at the history that you tell and how that's sort of, re it's revisionist in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think they, first of all, they did know each other yeah. uh, a bit. They both were Yale men. Uh, remember that Moses grew up in New Haven, actually, went to Yale. Um, you know, they, Logue, I think, admired some of what Moses had done. Uh, 
Vogue did like roads, I have to say, even though, you know, he, he was a road man and he thought that that was going to save cities. In the end, we realized today it, people can leave them as easily as come into them um, with roads. But, you know, he, he admired the beat, what he did at the beaches and, you know, parks. He did not admire the housing, the clearance. The, you know, there were a lot of things he disliked. And I think he saw himself as much more progressive socially than, than Moses ever was. He thought Moses was arrogant and uh, also he had a lot of criticisms of him. Um, but, you know, one of the things that um, I think we have lost in uh, the critiques of Moses and more broadly, the critiques of urban renewal and a lot of federal actions where we see redlining and negative consequences is any confidence that government can do good things. And so I guess if there is a takeaway uh, from my book that I hope will have some impact today, it's that government can do bad things, but government can also do good things. And there are some things that only government can do. And that the private sector is not a substitute for all things. And that, you know, some of the messes that cities have gotten into today with the Amazon sweepstakes, for example, you know, bidding to try to woo corporations for uh, the, you know, the, 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 the capital they would bring to cities and in return, giving them all kinds of tax breaks and taking on burdens on transportation and infrastructure that there's been gonna be no compensation for. That, that just is not a solution. And that, you know, we do need the dollars that only the federal government can supply because only the federal government can take on debt. Cities and states can't do that. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I, I want people to recognize that we should be very critical of the bad things the government has done, the negatives, but we also shouldn't give up hope. And we should look for the moments when federal money did go to some good causes. Well, that, that's something I appreciate uh, in all of your work, and especially this one, uh, the way that we have to look at what they achieved and the lessons we learned from what they got wrong. And, and, and in fact, as, as comes through so well in Logue's career, the lessons that he learned from what he got wrong, but then by the time he learned them, he didn't have the money anymore to make these things happen because the federal commitment had been so severely withdrawn. And, and that's part of what makes a lot of the story uh sad uh, in, in, yeah. in some ways. Uh, but I think you're right. I, I, I think uh, the lessons, uh, at least some of the lessons are very clear. And this is a time we live in a moment when there's ongoing discussion about cities um, The during, now it's finally winding down, but during the, the coronavirus, uh, there was a lot of talk about different cities and their struggles uh, in, in managing it and coming out of it. Certainly in New York, this was the case. Um, are there other lessons that come through from this book about how cities today can deal with many of the challenges that they're facing? Well, you know, I think COVID has had a, a silver lining if we get, for example, the infrastructure uh, bill uh, passed and that there has been a willingness to spend money we sort of all we elected a Democratic president who might be more inclined that way, but you know the money that went, the extra unemployment, the child care uh, benefits, the you know a, a recognition, particularly post Trump, where he was pushing it onto the states to solve, um, that you know we do need federal action. Um, so you know that if if this if it happens, that will be a real positive because we are living with the infrastructure that was built right after World War II and into the 50s. You know, we're living with those roads, with those bridges, with those tunnels, some of them even back earlier to the 30s, to the New Deal. Um, and we just, it, we're on borrowed time. And, you know, we just have not been making the investments in our society that say the Chinese are making in theirs and their trains and their fast trains and planes now that they're gonna be building and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I I think that's a that's a positive, um, but we do need to remain vigilant. Uh, you know, uh, there are reasons why people are skeptical about government. Their interests a lot, a lot. There are a lot more lobbyists today than ever before. Uh, 
And we do have to be very careful about money in politics and voter suppression and all of that. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that, you know, we will, we've learned some lessons. Well, I am uh, so grateful uh, for this conversation and for your generosity of time. I'm grateful, as I've said before, but I'll say again on the record for others to hear, I'm grateful for all of your scholarship and uh, for the influence it's had on uh, me and, and probably thousands of other scholars like me. Um, and I'm just so honored, Liz, that you uh, joined us today on Empire State Engagements to talk about uh, this wonderful book. Uh, again, for everybody, if you haven't gotten it already, it's Saving America's Cities by the great Elizabeth Cohen. Uh, and so learn more of what we were talking about today. Um, thank you so much, Liz, for being well, here. Thank you. It was fun. I enjoyed it. You were, you were a very vigilant reader. So I, I appreciate that. Well, the reading was a pleasure and I'm grateful for the conversation. Thank you so much. My pleasure.